Welcome once again to TLC World. Continuing the general theme of man's relationship with God, I want to take a look at some of the tough challenges that Jesus sets for Christ followers. Let's start by looking at two scriptures relevant to this particular message. The first is contained in Matthew 11, verses 28 to 30. And it goes like this. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In the specific context of Jesus' times, this passage should be viewed as a call to be free from the legalistic burden of the Jewish religion at the time and to give all these burdens to him. After all, the Old Testament, which contained the Jewish law, listed over 600 do's and don'ts. The second scripture enables us to make sense of the first. It's also in the book of Matthew in chapter five, verse 17. Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. These two scriptures taken together convey the fact that faith in Jesus fulfills all the requirements of the law. That is the Jewish law contained in the Old Testament. There are two main reasons for this. The first is that the Old Testament, which was concerned with the law and the prophets, was constantly pointing to the birth, life, death and resurrection of Jesus. In fact, over 300 Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled in Jesus. Secondly, Jesus was the only man who was actually able to keep the law perfectly. So he paid all the penalties that should have been suffered by a disobedient human race. This led to Christ, not the law, becoming our standard of right behavior, which of course could lead to a right relationship to God for everyone. Now this is comforting because our compliance with the law depends on not, not on being obedient to the many rules and regulations making up the law, but simply on faith in Christ. However, we also need to recognize that Jesus states in Matthew 5.17 that he has not actually abolished the law and it still applies. We might make sense of the situation this way. Suppose I have a friend who is a very high-ranking judge, who is an expert in the legal system and knows and obeys all the laws of the land, but who also knows that I have very little knowledge of them. So he tells me to trust him and do just as he does and assures me that I will be complying with all the laws of the land. These laws then have not been abolished but I can fulfill them by having faith and trust to follow my friend. Of course, my example falls far short because when we place our trust in Jesus, we have a friend who is also the creator of the whole universe and everything in it, who has infinite knowledge of all things and who chose to pay all our legal penalties by his sacrifice on the cross. He is also the friend who will accompany those who trust in him through life and guide each one of their to their ultimate heavenly destination. While we might be forgiven for thinking, this is great, there's no need for me to know and follow so many individual requirements now, the truth is that faith in Christ, although it replaces the need to comply with numerous rules of behavior, also raises the bar for those who choose to follow Christ. Let me explain. The Jewish laws of the Old Testament are primarily concerned with outward action. The famous Ten Commandments are typical. And only Commandment 1, you shall have no other gods before me, and Commandment 10, you shall not covet, imply some inward mental activity as well as outward action. 
Jesus, however, places much more emphasis on the inner mental activity than is evident in the requirements of the law. The old saying, it's the thought that counts, certainly would get a ready hearing from Jesus, who is equally as concerned with inner motivation as he is with outward action. In Matthew 5, verses 21 to 22, for example, Jesus stated, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. For Jesus, murder in the mind is just as sinful as the act of murder itself. In a similar manner, in Matthew 5, verses 27 to 28, Jesus states, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Again, we see here that Jesus is concerned as much with the thought processes as the actual action. In both of these scriptures, we see that Jesus raises the bar, that is, sets higher standards by actually extending the requirements of the law to include thought processes as well as actions. We all need to recognize that first, the root of action is often in our thought life, and secondly, our thought life often leaves much to be desired. In fact, I believe there is no one who would want every single thought they have to be exposed to public view. And this goes for non-Christians and Christians alike. However, what we all need to know is that every detail of our thought life has already been exposed to the Lord. King David highlights this in Psalm 139, verse 2, when he speaks to God, saying, You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. It is later highlighted in the New Testament in Matthew 9, verse 4, where we read, Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, Why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Furthermore, we should be aware that the spiritual battle with the devil's forces is very much a battle for the mind, all of which makes it clear that thought control is a significant issue. In view of this, Christ followers should have a heart for controlling their thought life, but of course, they may find that that is not quite as easy as it sounds. There is good news though. For although Christ expects much in this area, he also provides the solution to the mind control problem. The core of the solution for those of us who wish to exercise this mind control is in Matthew 19 verse 26, when Jesus states, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. God then provides us with a tangible approach to the problem as he speaks through Paul in Philippians 4, verse 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. In 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, he advises that we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. When our minds are plagued by thoughts that are not god honoring the approach is to force our minds to think on alternative thoughts that are god honoring Now from personal experience, I can tell you that this will be a struggle at first, as the devil tries to wrestle your mind back into his territory. But with prayer and practice, you will become more successful. Now it's unlikely that you will be 100% successful at controlling your thought life, but I'm convinced that God is pleased with and will honour the effort. In Matthew 5, verse 43 to 44, 
Jesus states, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Now I feel I am on safe ground when I say that we all have a natural inclination to hate our enemies and any notion of love is furthest from our minds. However, I am reminded of a report I heard quite recently of a Christian who was about to be executed by an ISIS fighter and who turned to the fighter and said, I know you will kill me but I give you my Bible. The ISIS fighter did kill the Christian, but also started to read the Bible and has subsequently converted to Christianity. I think we see here true love for one's enemies in action. The love this Christian showed for his killer in caring about the killer's eternal destiny, even on the point of death, reminds us of Jesus' prayer to his father as he was dying on the cross, surrounded by a jeering, hostile crowd. In Luke 23, verse 24, Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Now please don't take this as a call to physically enter your enemy's territory, so to speak, because this is a call that only God can give. But at the very least, in compliance with Jesus' command, we should pray for our enemies. In order to do this, we need a God perspective, not a man's perspective. A God perspective is captured by Paul in Ephesians 6.12, which goes like this. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Man's universal enemy is Satan, not flesh and blood fellow human beings. In the story of the Christian and the ISIS fighter that I've just related, there's an implied recognition on the part of the Christian that behind this evil lies Satan. A God perspective sees the ISIS fighter as merely a pawn in the devil's game and heading for a future of eternal damnation in the company of the devil himself. It's just such a perspective that allows us to pray for our enemies to escape the clutches of Satan by giving their lives to Christ. In Matthew 5, verse 39, Jesus says, I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, Turn to them the other cheek also. Now before going on to discuss this particular verse, we need to understand that a generally accepted principle of interpreting the Bible is through hyperbole. Hyperbole is the use of words and phrases that say more than they actually mean in order to reinforce the importance of a biblical principle. The Bible makes frequent use of this technique. For example, in Matthew 23, verse 24, we can read, Blind guides, you strain your water so you won't accidentally swallow a gnat, but you swallow a camel. In the same way that no one literally swallows a camel, Jesus is not necessarily stating that we should actually offer our other cheek for slapping but rather he is highlighting the principle that we are not to seek revenge against someone who has done us harm. In not seeking revenge, Christ followers can take comfort in Paul's statement in Romans 12 verse 19. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. In this sense, Christians can let go and let God, so to speak. Of course, letting go is not always easy. But as is the case with the inclination to hate our enemies, 
overcoming the desire to exact revenge requires a God perspective. In other words, overcoming this desire for revenge is only possible when we look behind the actions of those who have done us harm and, through prayer, come strongly against the spiritual forces of evil that are at work in their lives. Let me summarize. Being a Christ follower has its challenges and these are most often felt when we are called upon to go against what appear to be our natural inclinations. The three challenges discussed in this message are very much of this kind for we are called upon to control our natural inclination to let our thoughts wander where they will, to hate our enemies and to look for ways of seeking revenge against anyone who has done us harm. However, Christ has not provided these challenges without also providing the means by which we are able to meet them. Fundamental to meeting each of them is an understanding of the spiritual reality of existence convey conveyed in Ephesians 6.12. Letting our minds wander into unsavoury territory and gloating over any misfortunes that those we consider to be our enemies suffer and looking for ways to personally make them suffer will give us short-term highs at the expense of long-term peace. And I believe this to be the same for Christians and non-believers alike. If you're a Christ follower and you are falling short in these areas, my message to you is that the challenges set by Christ are a central aspect of our journey to becoming more Christ-like and should be viewed as such. If you're not yet a believer, my message to you is that you will never achieve the long-term peace we all seek without accepting Christ and his challenges. If this is what you wish to do and you know someone who has already accepted the challenges of Christ and you can see the evidence of this in his or her life, then ask them to help you take the life-changing step of becoming a follower of Christ. Failing this, please email me on goodnews at littlechurchworld.org and I will be happy to help you make the most important decision you will ever make in your life. Many thanks for joining me this week and I look forward to sharing another TLC World message next week. Until then, goodbye and God bless.